Welcome everyone. I'm Emily Venanzi, and I'm a member of the ALK Positive Medical Committee and also an ALK patient diagnosed in 2017. With me is Colin Barton, chair of the medical committee. Hi everyone, I'm Colin Barton and I was diagnosed with stage four ALK cancer in 2016. We are so honored and excited to have two of the world's leading and most highly respected ALK experts Dr. Ross Kamich at University of Colorado and Dr. Christine Lovely at Vanderbilt University to speak with us about two topics that should be of interest to everyone in our out positive community. Firstly, what is available for patients today when a patient's cancer becomes resistant to the currently approved ALK inhibitors, including lorlatinib? And secondly, looking to the horizon what is research and developing that may become standard of care in the future and that might improve patient outcomes even more than the current ALK inhibitors? Or, dare we say the word, turn ALK positive cancer into a manageable or even curable disease? There is so much for us to learn on these topics from Dr. Lovely and Dr. Kemmage. And with only 55 minutes, there probably won't be any time for questions and answers. In the years before ALK targeted therapy drugs, the expected survival time for stage four ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer without any treatment was typically less than one year. And even with chemotherapy, radiation and surgery, it was less than two years. ALK inhibitors have been somewhat of a miracle, improving the median survival time to more than six years. And that figure is still increasing. However, we now know that ALK inhibitors are not a cure and that sooner or later, the cancer becomes resistant to all currently approved inhibitors. When a patient's cancer becomes resistant to all the ALK inhibitors, including lorlatinib, thankfully, there are nowadays a number of options for further treatment, including several that are still experimental, but exciting and promising. During the first half of this session, doctors Lovely and Kamage will talk to us about what those treatment options are, how they present those options to their patients, and how they guide patients to the option that best suits their particular cancer and risk, risk tolerance. In the second half of this session, Dr. Lovely and Dr. Kamage will bring us hope and anticipation by discussing what's on the horizon in the way of new therapies and giving us a basic explanation of how these new therapies work. Thank you very much for being here today, Dr. Lovely and Dr. Kamage. We're really looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks for having us. Yes, absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here today. And hi to everyone out there who has taken their Saturday to call in for this session. And Emily, if you would, can you call us by our first names? If Christine, you're okay with that? Of course. Sure. Thanks. So maybe you can lead us off by, by talking about a situation where a patient comes to you or where one of your patients has been on TKI therapy, perhaps even multiple TKIs and are now at the point where lorlatinib is not keeping their cancer from growing anymore. What is, is your, usually your approach in that situation and what are the different options that you present to patients in that situation? Christine, do you wanna go first? Actually, I would love to say before we jump into answering this question is, um, I, I hope that we will have enough time for a Q&A &A and, and that we can hear some of the questions from the audience. Um, I think this is really such a great opportunity for people to ask questions and understand mm -hmm. every situation is different and really you know, have an opportunity for everybody who's called in to uh, talk with us about it because we'd love to hear what you're thinking as well in terms of um, opportunities for next lines of therapy. And so we really want this to be as much of a two-way dialogue as we possibly can. I agree. Okay, well, I will start and say, this is a really loaded question and it's an important one. It's the million dollar question, the billion dollar question, if you will. And, and uh, I think it's important to note, um, when we see patients in clinic, we treat patients, not their cancer. And so when we think about therapies for any patient with lung cancer, it's really a combination of um, an individual's tumor history, what stage they have, what treatments they've received in the past, what toxicities or side effects they've had from those treatments, what other medical issues are going on, where they live, some of their life constraints that may alter you know, how they come in for therapy, how they 
um, approach therapy. And so it's really, you know, a totality that we think about. It's absolutely not a one size fits all approach. And so as we talk about different possibilities, um, recognize that there are lots of factors that um, come into play when we talk to patients about where we're going to go next with our therapies. And some of those factors have to do with their disease status. Some of them have to do with the drugs they've had before. And some of them have to do with other medical problems and, and life in general. And, and that's incredibly important in thinking about how we select therapies for patients. I will also say, you know, um, I don't want anyone out there to think that lorlatinib is the last line. That is absolutely not the case. Um, it's not, we don't want anyone to think, uh oh, I'm, 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 I'm getting to lorlatinib and, and then there's not gonna be anything else for me. No, um, and there are options that we think about for um, targeted therapies, chemotherapy, trials, intercalating local therapy. And so I'm gonna jump in and say as one example, um, if a patient comes to me and they're progressing on lorlatinib, and let's say you know, that there's one spot of cancer in the lung or a growing spot in the liver, the first thing I'm gonna think about is, can I call up my friendly radiation oncologist and say, hey, I have this patient, they're on lorlatinib, they're tolerating it well, uh, their disease is mostly stable, but there's this tumor spot in the liver that is growing. And is there anything you can do to help us in terms of what we call local therapy, um, doing something ablative to one side of disease that's progressing. To me, that's a paradigm I use a lot in my practice, um, and I see a lot of other people using it as well. And we really want to maximize the, the, the time on drug that we get and, and being too quick to pivot to a new therapy sometimes, whether it's a new TPI or a new um, chemotherapy or a trial, you know, if we can use some alternative modalities like surgery or radiation or radiofrequency ablation, that to me is incredibly important to um, maximize the time that any patient has on a particular TKI. And so I will say one option um, after progression on lorlatinib that we uh, frequently see is there's a site or more than one that can be controlled with some sort of local therapy like radiation or surgery. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think I think the key thing is to kind of unpack your question. You know, what do you do after lorlatinib? And, you know, in the clinic, the first question I'm going to go is, well, did you, you know, have you responded to other ALK inhibitors in the past or have you just blown through everything? So is the initial diagnosis right? How long did you have it? Then, like Christine's point, progression isn't just progression, progression, progression. You know, how many sites is it? Where is it located? If it's in the brain as opposed to the body, you also get to ask the question about what dose of drug you're on and is there any potential for going up on the dose? I guess what you're maybe getting at, so let you know, so those are all important points that you have to ask, but let's imagine the obvious situation where you initially responded, you're then on something which then the cancer evolves. It's not just a single site of disease. It's not just progression in the brain. You know, the whole disease exploded everywhere. You know, your basic nightmare scenario, what do you do? And the first thing you want to try and do is figure out, can you determine why the cancer is growing? And that's under a liquid biopsy. And if you see something on the liquid biopsy, great. But if you don't see anything on it, I would still do a tissue biopsy. And then this is where sometimes I email Christine and say, I, I, I found this. What, what does this mean? So two broad categories. You turned back on ALK signaling. So it's an ALK alteration that allows ALK to be firing. So ALK is the thing still driving the cell or ALK is still suppressed. There's no obvious emerging ALK resistance mutation, but something else is going on. There's, a, there's someone else, a, a kind of hidden person driving the cancer, helping it out. Sometimes you can recognize it and that's great. We can talk about that and you can add in other treatments. And then there's this situation which is increasingly common, which is you can't find that second driver. It's an unknown driver. I'm, go I'm speaking in little sound bites, Christine. Otherwise, you know, yeah. each of us could give a lecture for an hour. So we're absolutely. Gonna... So yeah. this is a really, really, really loaded. Tag, topic. you're it. <laughs> yes. Um, so first, my voice is not as nice or beautiful as Ross's, and my accent is nowhere near as nice. As I don't. I disagree. So, uh, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell him he has the best accent. So I just saw there's a bunch of questions coming in through the chat, which is fantastic. I saw one come up that said, 
what, how do you even call progression? That's a really, really, really important, yet not always obvious question. And so let's unpack that for a second. How do we even call progression? Um, that's not necessarily straightforward. And, and when you look at a lot of scans, and I encourage you, please look at your scans with your doctor. Um, that really helps you to understand what we're looking at, what the radiologists are looking at, and, and why sometimes it's ambiguous. You know, it does, it's not always um, so clear cut to call progression. We don't always go from a scan today that shows the tumor is stable to a scan, you know, three months from now that shows the tumor is growing. There's a lot of subtle changes. Sometimes there's overlying things like pneumonia or other infections that come into play. Um, and really the, the, the discussion around progression, there are multiple different scenarios as well. And there are definitely times where it's obvious and you're like, well, this tumor has, you know, wasn't there before and now it's there now. That's clear progression, right? If I get a CT scan today and there's no spots in the liver and three months from now, there's five spots in the liver, that's clear progression. Um, but if I see a scan today where there's five spots in the liver and they're each about a centimeter and three months from now, each of those spots is about 1.1, 1.2 centimeters. That's not really progression. Um, and and I, I urge caution with how to interpret a, a small amount of growth along those lines, especially if there's no new sites of disease, if the patient's doing well on TKI therapy. And so I think whoever asked this question, it's a really fantastic question. It's not always obvious. How do we actually call progression? And sometimes, and probably a lot of people in the audience have experienced this, is we actually continue to treat a little bit beyond true progression. If we see you know, tumor spots that are growing, and, but the patient, they're not growing fast, um, there are not, no new spots, the patient is tolerating TKI therapy well, we may continue to, to, to you know, use TKI therapy. And, and there's a lot of factors that go into that decision as well. Factors related to patient preferences, factors related to what other therapies are available, um, what other therapies may not be available depending on a certain patient's other medical conditions. And so calling progression is not always black or white uh, and really involves active discussions in some cases amongst you know, the patient and their physician and the radiologist and other members of the care team so we can really um, understand these the nuances of, of how tumors grow. Ross, is that fair from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's it's a recognition that you know for somebody who has very indolent progression, you got to see the big picture. I had a patient the other week who was ninety years old, and their cancer appeared to be growing one millimeter a year. And so, great, in you know by the time they're hundred, it'll be a centimeter bigger. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't that fussed about it for them. And we said, well, you know, we're not going to change anything. So you have to put it into context. But uh, let's, Christine, let's, let's drill down into some details here. Yeah. So, you know, there's lots of questions. And I think when I see the questions, a lot of them are kind of like, well, just tell me which is the next drug to go on to. And that, you know, A must always be followed by B must always be followed by C, I think actually goes against the spirit of what has been developed over the last 10 years, which is personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. So not everybody develops the same mechanism of acquired resistance. And therefore, if you can, you want to try and find out what's going on in your cancer and then personalize the treatment. So some people have said, can you resensitize to the other ALK inhibitors? And the answer is anything's possible. You just want the data. There are some mutations in ALK that lorlatinib doesn't work on, but for example, crizotinib does. There are situations where you can have two mutations occurring in the same gene. That's called a compound mutation. And there, that's where the fourth generation drugs, the turning point drug and the new valent drug may be important. But if that's not your mechanism resistance, these aren't the solutions. So it's about, if it's important to know that you were ALK instead of EGFR or ROS1 or everything at the beginning, it's just as important to know that when you develop acquired resistance. Yes, and I would say serially over time too. So we never really, in the ideal case scenario, want to make um, treatment decisions without the molecular data, even if that means we're getting molecular at every you know, potential change in therapy. That, that's the best case scenario um, to make the most informed treatment decision possible. Because if any of you were on the, the research conference earlier today, you know, tumors evolve. And whatever pressure we put on the tumor, whatever drug, it's going to find a way to escape the effects of that drug. And, but the only way we're going to start to unpack 
how the tumor escapes the effects of the drugs is by doing some of the molecular studies that we can in the clinic. If someone has a, an oncologist who, for them, that's not their standard practice. So say they just automatically will put the patient on chemo as the next line of treatment. Um, what would you say to them? Would, would you suggest they then go and get a second opinion from a different doctor to, or, or you know, have their doctor talk to one of you to encourage this um, further testing when they have progression? Yes. <laughs> I, would, I would say both. I think it is um, perfectly fair for you to ask your physician, say, hey, can we get molecular studies on my tumor? Mm -hmm. uh, can we send a liquid biopsy if we're considering changing therapy? Absolutely. I think it's absolutely also, this is a paradigm that we use a lot is second opinions, people coming in for um, you know, help and partnering with local oncologists. And by that, I mean, you know, I'm in Tennessee, um, Ross is in Colorado. You know, it's very common for us to be talking to physicians in New York, California, Florida, I mean, that's just part of our day-to-day -day job. And so I think, you know, having more than one physician on your team is good. And, and seeking a, advice from somebody who thinks a lot about ALK is good because there are a lot of physicians out there who are not as lucky as Ross and I are to be able to see a lot of ALK positive patients. And so having that experience behind or expertise on your team is always a good thing. And someone is asking, before localized therapy, so what you were talking about before, Christine, about just a smaller, a, an, an individual spot of progression that could be potentially treated locally with radiation or something like that, would you get molecular testing at that point or is that not necessary? I would because I, I like that um, the level of granularity that comes with, you know, hey, something's changing and I, right. I see that. Uh, and I'd like to know if I can, what's going on at that point in time. You know, there are certain local therapies, like if it's a surgery, they're, go they're gonna get tissue. If they're gonna do um, like an ablation procedure where they actually have to go in and do something semi-invasive, they can get tissue at that time as well. So um, for radiation, they don't have to get tissue for radiation. So then it becomes a, if I wanna do I, for, for, my, for me personally in my practice, it really depends on how quickly you know, the patient, if I'm going to send a patient for radiation, usually the radiation takes a few days to plan. Mm -hmm. It may give me opportunity to get in time to get a biopsy in that, that frame. And so, you know, I, I, I think it's information is power and, it, and it's helpful to have that. If the patient agrees to have a biopsy, if we can um, get it set up in, in a reasonable amount of time, I don't ever want to prolong somebody's care if I don't have to, but usually the radiation planning takes a few days. And so we try to get a biopsy within that time frame, if possible. Okay. What are some of the considerations that you would take into account if you've got a patient that definitely does have progression, definitely has it in multiple sites, definitely the TKIs are really clearly starting to really fail. Um, obviously chemotherapy, immunotherapy, uh, fourth generation TKIs, uh, even, you know, things that are maybe considered experimental at this stage, like TILs, ADCs. Mm -hmm. How do you decide where you're going to direct that patient? What, what are the factors that you would take into account? Uh, obviously, as you said, every patient's got their own particular situation. Uh, different patients have a different degree of how much they want to take a risk, uh, but on the other hand, have the potential curative situation. Uh, so, you know, I understand all those factors, but I'll, I'll let you and uh, Dr. Kamage Ross uh, kind of talk about that for the next five or 10 minutes. Who's going first? You go first. Someone's got Ross. a blink. Oh, yeah, I'm going to blink. Okay, right. Go for okay. it. Go for right. it. So one, of the, so one of the things, and this is coming out in the chat, is the solutions are partly to do with the patient, but they're partly to do with the healthcare system you're in. You know, if that if that drug isn't available in your country, there's no point, you know, wishing for the moon that you, you don't have access to. So you have to tailor it. I, I would say in general, um, if you do not find an identified and actionable mechanism of resistance on some kind of biopsy, then you have two choices. So you're either shooting from the hip saying, oh, well, I'm just going to try another alkyl inhibitor. I'm going to do this. 
But you, if you do that, you should almost expect it not to work and therefore have close surveillance. So you shouldn't just go, look, I rebiopsy you, there's no mutation. I'm gonna stick you on lorlatinib and scan you in three months time. I think that's the wrong thing to do. You can certainly try the lorlatinib, but your chance of response may be 20% or less. And therefore I would have a relatively early scan, you know, maybe at six weeks just to see what's going on. If you don't do that or you try that and it's not working, then it's about hemotrexid based chemotherapy, assuming you're chemotherapy naive. And the current debate is, do you add that into the tyrosine kinase inhibitor that you were on last, assuming you were tolerating it, or do you stop the TKI and then you can have the chemotherapy either on its own or the option of adding in immunotherapy. I can tell you what I do. I cannot prove it's the right thing to do. I keep the TKI going and I add in carboplatin and pemetrexid on the basis that I'm assuming the TKI was controlling some of the disease and I don't want to take that away. Yeah, and I do the same thing. The only possibility I would consider stop, and I would also at first, um, you know, we believe that TK, we have data. TKI is, is, is for CNS metastasis um, significantly better than some of the other therapies that we have. Um, I would only consider stopping TKI in that, con in that context if there was some toxicity associated with the TKI, that's all. But otherwise I would do the exact same thing as layer on carboplatin and pemetrexid. Um, pemetrexid we also call Olympta uh, onto TKI therapy. I will say, um, I think, you know, there's a, people have a lot of thoughts about chemotherapy and it, it, it's not a, a decision to be made lightly. Um, you know, this is um, controlled poison. Uh, I will say in my experience, I have seen some patients respond to chemotherapy better than they responded to TKI. And so I, I do believe that there is a role for chemotherapy, particularly platinum hemotrexid in patients with alkalosative lung cancer. So somebody in the chat has said, can you have chemo if you've had it in the past? And of course it's not yes or no. Um, so it depends. So let's imagine that you had cisplatin and pemetrexid in the adjuvant therapy session. You had four cycles and then you didn't have anything. And then your cancer relapses two years later. Of course you can. Of course you can go back onto it. So did you leave gas into the tank? The other one is, well, what if you were on it, you responded and then you stopped and then you spent five years on TKIs. Again, the cancer may forget how to be resistant. But if you had the chemotherapy six months ago and it's the same chemotherapy, that's probably less sensible. And I would just add to that too, not all chemotherapies are the same. And so different chemotherapy medicines act in different ways. And so they're not all acting just like um, resistance can develop in, in several ways within the tumor. Different chemotherapies act at different points in how the tumor grows. Um, and so when we're thinking about chemotherapy, my first gun is always platinum with pemetrexid uh, for patients with ALK, but there's other types of chemotherapy we can use as well if you've already had carboplatin and pemetrexid. The, uh, there were other questions about immuno, Emily and, and Colin, just rein me in. I'm just, I'm just you know, running with this here, but um, <laughs> you know, there were questions about immunotherapy. And I think when we say immunotherapy and we're talking PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors, I would say there is a vanishingly little data that it does anything in ALK. One question was about the Impal 150 regime, which uh, was a regime of carboplatin, paclitaxel, bevacizumab, and atezolizumab, so a kind of kitchen sink approach that did include some ALK patients in their study. Their ALK population at the end of the day was pretty small, and they kind of you know, suggested that maybe there was a benefit. That regime is not licensed in the US, although it's bundled within the license in, the, in Europe. The thing that for me is really telling is that data has only ever been shown in abstracts at meetings. It has never been published. And that tells me something about how good that data is. And it's not telling me it's good data. And we just add to that is that trial, the patients were all off ALK TKI therapy. So that was not chemotherapy uh, plus immunotherapy plus bevacizumab plus ALK TKI. There, were, there was no TKI in for patients, the, the few ALK patients who were treated on that trial. So looking at the chat, um, there is a lot of questions. Let's see what we haven't addressed yet. Uh, there was one question asking about what if the cancer has transformed to small cell? Yeah. Well, so, so it's the same kind of discussion, you know, is it localized? Can you zap it with radiotherapy? If it's not, 
you're adding in chemo, but you're probably using somewhat different chemotherapy. Um, now, that's a really interesting question about whether there's any role for immunotherapy. My, my guess is we don't know. I still suspect the rule is going to be true because it's not, it's not the same small cell that a, somebody who smoked for 60 pack years gets. It's a very unique kind of small cell in PKI. I don't know how much has that been studied in the lab, Christina. There are cell lines from oncogene derived small cell. There are not. I would say just to um, take a step back in this conversation and, and use one of the um, the uh, paradigms or examples that we use in, for another kind of lung cancer, EGFR mutated lung cancer with TKI therapy, a TKI called osimertinib or Tegriso. About 10% of patients who progress on Tegriso go from lung adenocarcinoma to small cell. Um, this is a very, very, very active area of research. And really want to underscore what Ross said is that this is not the same type of small cell that you may read about on the internet. Um, small cell, the classical kind, is typically uh, associated with um, heavy prior tobacco exposure, um, a very aggressive um, type of lung cancer. Um, whereas, you know, out transforms a small cell still case reports at this time. We don't have as much data as we do for EGFR mutant lung cancer. And ultimately, that may mean it happens less frequently with out than it does with EGFR. Um, and that's entirely possible. Uh, you know, thinking about um, transformation is that that necessitates a tissue biopsy. You cannot determine in 2021 whether a tumor has changed from lung adenocarcinoma to small cell with a liquid biopsy alone. Yeah, and that would be a great example where your liquid biopsy hasn't given you a mechanism of resistance and is, again, one of the reasons why a tissue biopsy might be useful in that setting. So we've um, had a couple of patients in our group, uh, including uh, President Gina Kollenbeck, uh, who came off lorlatinib and had some pretty significant issues uh, that they felt was attributable directly to just coming off the lorlatinib. Um, have you seen that? And do you have any comments about that? So I will say um, in the world of ALK, there's less data, but uh, a paradigm that we have, again, when you use my um, example of EGFR, there's a phenomenon in EGFR mutant lung called lung cancer called flare, where patients go off the TKI and they're just, they have a flare of disease. And what happens is, you know, if you have 100 tumor cells um, that are being treated with any ALF TKI and then the tumor becomes resistant, not all of those 100 tumor cells are actually resistant to TKI. And so that's a little bit of a hard concept to put, wrap your head around. It's not 100%. There are some tumor cells that still remain sensitive to TKI. This is what we call tumor heterogeneity. And so in data we have from EGFR is when you remove the TKI, the flare comes from those tumor cells that were still sensitive to the TKI actually now growing because they had the brakes on them with TKI, now you've taken the brakes off. Um, the frequency with which this occurs with ALF, I don't think we have an estimate of that. Um, I'm wondering if Ross... Uh, um, no, I think it's variable in the same way that some people have, you know, quicker or slower growing disease. But I think, you know, one, one of the things is, you know, where... You know, where, where can you sort of provide pressure as a, as a patient group? I really hate clinical trials that say you can go on if you're, you know, ALK positive and you've exhausted all therapies. And by the way, you now have to go into monotherapy with our, with our drug. I think the future is I want to develop combinations. And, and why aren't you doing that from the get-go? So yeah. that for me is an area of pressure. And G Gina is a great example of, you know, the, the nasty stuff that can happen whilst you're hanging around waiting. Yes, do I, I will call, say. Do I have to call Gina President Hollenbeck, which sounds wonderfully <laughs> formal? I will say to and echo that it is equally frustrating to us as as um, on as physicians. Like the, we always want things to go faster as well. You know, combinations coming into the clinic faster, the trials opening faster, coming into earlier lines of disease faster. Um, that is, some of the bottlenecks are are equally frustrating, and I a hundred and 10,000% agree with Ross is, you know, <laughs> there are very few diseases that we treat with one single drug. So if we think about other, like 
patients with diabetes, they usually start with one and then when it's not controlled, they'll take another diabetes drug of a different class or they may start off on two different diabetes medicines of different classes, meaning the two drugs work in different ways from the onset. Same thing if we think about HIV, you know, it's four to six drug therapy, same thing with tuberculosis. So why we don't do that for cancer really continues to elude and frustrate me when we know from many, many other you know, diseases that we treat that we have to attack whatever the disease process is in multiple different ways that really are our best options are gonna to be to take as many shots on goals the first time as possible. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's feasible because we have a trial um, that my colleague Tejas Patil is just opening, which is approved by the FDA, it's an investment. And I think it's gonna be, it's probably gonna be open at Vanderbilt. I think Wade was involved in that, Christine, mm -hmm. through the, the Atomic Consortium. And it essentially says, you have an oncogene addicted lung cancer, you progressed on your last TTI, and this can be algae, Javar, Ross one, and you have evidence in this example of MET as your, as your mechanism of acquired resistance, you stay on your prior dose of the TKI and you, and you add in this MET inhibitor initially at a slightly lower dose and then you go up. And the FDA allowed that. We didn't have to say this, it was this drug or that drug or the other one. We just you know, said stuff. And so I, I think that's the approach that we want in the future. Okay. We've gotten multiple questions about clinical trials and when should a patient consider a clinical trial. So if, if you could address that and then maybe from there start to talk about some of the clinical trial options for patients post TKI. Okay, so I'll, jump in. I'll, I'll start and say yeah. um, it's, it's always a time to think about a clinical trial. <laughs> uh, so there's never a wrong time to think about a clinical trial because number one, clinical trials are open for different parts of, of the disease journey, right? Whether you're talking about a clinical trial for the first therapy you ever receive, a clinical trial for the second therapy or beyond, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's always um, important and nice to be able to talk about clinical trial opportunities. Um, clinical trials open and close and they come and go. And so, you know, it, um, they're not around forever. They're, there's often a limited number of spots. And so I think another thing I want to say is um, it, it is common for us to say, hey, I don't have a clinical trial at Vanderbilt for you where I work, but maybe my colleague you know, in town or in another city has a trial that I think would be really good for you. You know, we, we keep up with this and know what's going on in the community and really always want to be able to offer best options for our patients. So we may say, you know, I have a trial here, but I don't think it's the best option. You know, maybe consider going to this other place and I'll make a referral for you. Um, you know, it is always good to think about options for clinical trials. It doesn't mean one's always gonna exist, but we can at least initiate that conversation. I'm, I'm gonna flesh that answer out with a little bit more skepticism. So a clinical trial is neither a good thing nor a bad thing. It is in you know, the hands of um, someone who, who knows about the disease, it can be the only avenue to get access to the right drug, but it could equally be in a completely dumb idea. And so, you know, you, you need to, just because it's a clinical trial, although there may be certain benefits of being looked after and fussed over a little bit more carefully, um, you know, I think you have to ask yourself, you know, is it the right drug? So um, as a small aside, you know, going back, some of you may know I'm writing a history of some of the, the, the lung cancer for a, for a book. And you can see some of the studies that were done in EGFR were completely stupid. And, you know, they, they, I won't phrase that in the book. I'll be much more diplomatic. But, you know, just because there's a clinical trial doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Terrific. I'd like to pivot the conversation around to what's really in the future. So, you know, we've all heard about TKIs. We've all heard about chemotherapy. We've all heard about radiation. But I think a huge percentage of the audience has not heard about vaccines or ADCs or anti antibody-based therapies or cellular therapies or protein degraders. And so if you'd like to maybe spend about five minutes on each of those different uh, new technologies that are developing on the horizon, in very simple terms, explain what they are and what the promise is and whether any of these are actually in some sort of clinical trial at the moment, uh, that'd be a great way to finish out this session. 
Christian, do you have favorite ones you want to grab from that list? I, I'll start, how about with ADCs? Okay. So what is an ADC? ADC stands for antibody drug conjugate. Um, and what an ADC is, is it's, so first of all, it's an infusional therapy. It's not a pill therapy. Um, it is a therapy that combines an antibody and antibodies are something we talk a lot about in 2021 with respect to cancer therapies. And of course, with respect to the ongoing, ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. So antibodies um, look like the shape of the letter Y. And what they do is the, the Y part here, see where my fingers are, binds to uh, a uh, bind to a target. Um, and that, <laughs> yes, Ross is sort of look like a peace sign, but imagine a stalk at the bottom of the peace sign. So the antibodies, they <laughs> how these guys are making me laugh. Stop it. <laughs> this is serious conversation. So the antibody binds to a target. Um, and in the case of antibody drug conjugates, now in 2021, um, what the antibody drug conjugate does is it, it combines the specificity of an antibody that binds to a target with something we call a payload. And payload is just a kind of fancy name for uh, a chemotherapy drug tagged on or bound to the antibody. And so what you can think of this as in simple terms is uh, more precise ways to develop, to deliver the bomb to the system. So if you wanna drop a bomb in a tumor cell, instead of just giving chemotherapy to every tumor cell, every cell in the body, an antibody drug conjugate has the potential to bring that chemotherapy more specifically to the site of the tumor based on a specific target that may be expressed on the tumor cell. And there's a lot of examples of um, ADCs that are being developed. It requires, at least right now, that the, the target has, an, uh, has a, a portion of the target outside the cell. So you know, proteins in a cell can be inside, outside, or both. Uh, and for an antibody drug conjugate to work, you need to have a target that has a portion outside the, the tumor cell itself. And what happens is it binds, this protein binds the antibody drug conjugate, brings it inside the cell. And by bringing the antibody inside the cell, it brings this chemotherapy agent uh, inside the cell, which then does all the nasty things that chemo does, but within the context of the tumor cell. There are many examples of these. Um, you know, one that has, has made a big splash this year is, a, is a, uh, an antibody drug conjugate designed against the, the, the protein HER3, um, which is HER3 is also called ERBB3. It's a member of the EGFR family of receptors of which there's EGFR, HER2, HER3, and HER4, uh, which we know are actually involved in lung tumor cell growth in general uh, and can be involved in resistance to ALK-TKI therapy. So one may envision a clinical trial of the HER3 antibody drug conjugate in patients with uh, resistance to ALK-TKIs that is driven by activation of the EGFR, HER2, HER3 family of kinases. I'll stop there. Okay, couple of things on a couple of things on antibody drug conjugates. So they're not directed against the same kind of mutations, everything else. Visual aid. Okay, here are look, I had this happen sitting by that my looks desk. Like a I trivia didn't, piece. Yeah, I just no look. So this is the pie chart of like ALK, EGFR, blah, blah, blah. Okay. ADCs are proteins which are just stuck on the surface of the cell, nothing to do with drug and cell. They look like this, messy and they overlap. So ALK or EGFR can have any of them and it can have more than one. They're just an address label that you're using as a FedEx address to send a toxin to. And one of the questions is, do they get into the brain? We don't think so, although strange enough in breast cancer, they have actually had some TNS responses, which is weird. We don't really understand that. Okay, what was next on your list? Colin? Wait, 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 sorry. I'm gonna, oh, I'm you gonna... want to keep going? I'm speaking at yeah. lovely speed here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna politely push back against Ross a little bit. And Go say, for it. Uh, I, I I would say I think there's a little bit more precision than it's just a messy level of 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 uh, so show the messy one, Ross. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna say I don't necessarily agree with that because I think okay, what, tell me why. Uh, actually, I don't think I know what happens is is when you block one pathway in a tumor cell, the tumor cell will upregulate other pathways. And so for ALK, when you block ALK, you actually increase expression of EGFR, HER2, and HER3. Um, it, it's not a genomic, it's not a DNA level change, but it's just how the cells rewire. And so okay. an ALK positive cell that is sensitive to TKI therapy 
has lower levels of HER3, HER2, and EGFR than an ALK positive cell that is resistant to TKI therapy. To me, that affords the opportunity of a little bit more precision in developing or delivering these ADCs. So it's not the messy pie chart that, that Ross showed, uh, but, it, but rather the dynamic nature in which tumor cells can rewire, find these detour pathways to get around ALK TKI. Okay, so what you're saying is they can still be overlapping, but the exact mess may look different for ALK versus EGFR versus whatever, when they've been treated, because some things will be more likely to be there. But trope 2, nappy 2B, some of these things are just generic. But yes, we need to analyze whether they're more or less likely to be present by driver oncogene. Correct. So there are some targets. Like I only have two plates. I you can't come up with other examples. <laughs> So there are some examples of Ross brought up trope two, which is, is a marker on the tumor cells that is, at least as far as we know in 2021, whether it's TKI sensitive or TKI resistant doesn't matter. But there are others, and I, there are several of them, including EGFR, HER2, and HER3, that are higher in the resistant tumor cells than in the sensitive tumor cells, which to me affords a window to be able to use those antibody drug conjugates in the setting of TKI resistance. But you still have to prove it's there first. In the tumor, yes. I think we have very good laboratory studies showing that that's true and, and modeling in tumor samples. But we would really like to deliver those therapies in a more precise way by actually having an assessment of HER3 levels on the tumor sample before the patient goes on to a study like that. Okay. So, anyway, ADCs essentially are a targeted chemotherapy, if we can put it that way in extremely simplistic terms. Would you agree with that, Dr. Lovely? Mm-hmm. And uh, there's definitely trials already in place and there'll be a heck of a lot more of them developing over the coming years for sure. So uh, great area of hope and uh, promise there. Um, another area that really excites uh, me is TIL. And uh, so if you two would like to take it away on TIL and talk about what that is and how it works and what you think the promise is there. Okay, TIL stands for tumor infiltrating lymphocyte. So inside your cancer, there's also some of your immune cells sometimes who have clearly failed to do their job, but they're still sitting there. The TIL strategy is you take a largely a biopsy of the tumor. People have also tried to do it from a bone marrow biopsy, but let's, let's take it the straightforward way. You take a fairly sizable chunk, like the size of a sugar cube, kind of about one centimeter cubed, and then you mush it up you extract out these lymphocytes who have somehow failed to do their job. You expand them in a laboratory. So now there's, you know, millions of them and you get them super excited. You give them a pep talk mm -hmm. and then you infuse them back into the patient and say, you can do it. It's the second half. I know we were losing in the first half. You can do it. Sometimes it works. Not often. Christine, what do you think? So first I'm going to, um, rewind a minute and say lymphocytes is, is a fancy word for a type of immune cell um, and that, that we all have um, and they can be directed against many different things, tumors, viruses, bacteria. Um, I, I agree uh, with Ross and, and I seldom disagree with Ross. And so if you see us po like kind of poking at each other, that's all in good fun. It's, it's, it's just part of areas where, where we're all learning as well. And that's how we learn from each other. And so I agree. I think sometimes it works. Um, we don't really know how to deliver the tills to the size of the tumor with any sort of specificity in 2021. I do think that will change. And so I think we'll see a lot of movement in this field. I'm going to be honest and say, I don't think ALK is where we're going to see the largest movement to begin with. Um, but hopefully what we learn from treating other tumor types and other types of lung cancer with TILs would be to help then bring that into the world of alpha positive lung cancer. But let's inject a little note of reality in terms of how successfully our remotivated team actually wins the game. At the moment, it's, hey, they won a game once. Maybe they could do it again. That is probably the level we're at. We are at single patient case report stuff where when they present it, it's like, Mrs. Jones did awesome. And what you don't see is the huge room full of Mrs. Jones's who didn't work. Yes, absolutely. And, and probably a lot of you out there have seen in your local media press, like, hey, this patient had an amazing response to this TIL therapy. And um, those are the anecdotes right now. But I, I will say, 
um, going back in time, you know, it once was anecdotes for patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer to be respond to EGFR TKIs. And those anecdotes then taught us a huge amount about why patients respond to EGFR TKIs. And I went back to EGFR because that was our first paradigm of precision medicine in lung cancer. So I think uh, we are still at the level of anecdotes. I'm very hopeful that those anecdotes will teach us how to use these therapies in better ways as, as we have proven in the past with other types of therapy, but definitely not in 2021, it's not a magic bullet by any, by any stretch of the imagination. And one can imagine that could be Bart, because your immune system failed on the job initially for multiple different reasons. And just putting more of the same immune cells in, even if they have, so a pep talk in this sense, you know, you give them various growth factors to stimulate them. Um, you know, sometimes if that was the block, that's the answer. But if it's because the cancer is great at rejecting them no matter how many there are, you know, then, then that's not going to be the answer. So the key thing almost on Christine's point is if you get one person and it works, that's the beginning of the journey, not the end. Because then you have to say, why did it work in that one person so that we can rationally say this is the solution that somebody should or shouldn't go forward with in the future? So uh, some of the other therapies that we're aware of include vaccines and um, cellular therapies, protein degraders, small molecules, even gene editing. So I'll, I'll let you take it away on those and uh, you can talk about the ones that you're most excited about first and leave the ones you're least excited about till the end. And don't forget about the fourth generation TKIs as well. I know we have a lot of interest in the TPX. Those, those, those we kind of covered because they make sense if you have a compound mutation. Okay. So if, if you have a second driver, a fourth generation drug is not the answer. Right. Christine, it's your turn. No, I picked, the, I picked ADC, so you pick your next therapy. Of <laughs> I, I, I just did. I just did. What did we do? What, I can't remember. I did no, tills. Colin brought up the tills. No, I did the tills. Gotta... It's your turn. Okay. So I am going to say... Um, uh, next level. So, you know, as, as has been alluded to in the chat, you know, these SHIP2 inhibitors that are, are coming oh. in. Um, this is uh, something that is, 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 there are many of them. Many drug companies have them right now. The idea of a SHIP2 inhibitor, so SHIP2 is, I would say, a partner protein uh, for many uh, different kinases, such as ALK within a tumor cell. So what do I mean by that? Let me describe that a little bit more. Um, a partner protein. So like SHIP2, uh, ALK needs SHIP2 um, and some other partner proteins to be able to interact with, to be able to talk to other parts, other proteins in the cell that ultimately make the signal to the tumor cell to grow. And so ALK in and of itself is not the, the only thing in the tumor cell that's telling the tumor cell to grow. It has to interact with other components of the tumor cell machinery to be able to say, get that growth message to the tumor, uh, to the tumor cell. So SHIP2 is an ALK partner protein that helps ALK talk to other important pieces of the tumor cell machinery that send a growth signal. Um, SHIP2 is not specific for ALK. It actually is a partner protein for many different proteins uh, within the tumor cell and within normal cells as well. There is some rationale to use SHIP2 inhibitors since in theory, since SHIP2 interacts, it's a partner protein with a lot of the components of the tumor cell machinery, you have the potential opportunity to overcome multiple different mechanisms of resistance at the same time. So if ALK uses SHIP2 and MET uses SHIP2, EGFR is a partner with SHIP2, and you give a SHIP2 inhibitor, the thought is that you then block signaling through all of those different pieces of the tumor shell machinery. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, here's my take on SHIP2. SHIP2 is too commonly used by multiple signaling pathways. It's too blunt an instrument. And um, I think looking back, SHIP2 will be viewed as what it rhymes with. So I think, you know, why do we use it right now? So first I will say, you know, the development of drugs against this target was a real advancement in terms of drug design and drug chemistry. And so that it's, it proves to the, the, the field of cancer research that you know, some of the targets that we thought were untargetable, some, not every um, 
protein in the cell, it's so obvious how to block it. And so developing SHIP2 inhibitors really was a lesson to us as cancer researchers, like, yeah, you know, if you're creative and you think outside the box, you can maybe find ways to block proteins that you didn't traditionally think you could. Um, it's, it is semi-targeted, although to Ross's point, you know, SHIP2 is, is a partner protein with, with many um, targets in the cell. I think the jury is still out because these trials are still ongoing. Um, Should we have a bet, Christine? No, I'm not a betting woman. Okay. <laughs> I, I want to go on data, not 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 betting. All right. Anyway, I, I, know how, I know how Ross would bet in this way anyway, in this regard yeah. anyway. So. I just think it's too toxic. It's the, and I have the kind of same opinion with kind of, you know, MAC and ERK inhibitors. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do it on a cell line because the cell line doesn't have side effects. Um, but I just think that these aren't solutions in the real world for a patient other than a brief flash in the pan. We have a question here about what about guilt, and I can't pronounce this correctly, but what about guilt or Okay, Ross, it's your turn. Oh, poop. Uh, I can't even remember what it does, but this is some cell line where they squirted it on one cell line and it would look less happy. And it's like, that's fine. You know, to paraphrase, um, you know, Jerry Maguire, show me the data in patients. I guess that I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I think one to watch would even be an exaggeration. It's like, okay, you know, so far so good. We've got another question. What about adding Avastin to chemotherapy? Does that work for ALK patients? Well, I think that is a really interesting question. I think uh, we know that, you know, going back a gazillion years that, you know, uh, blood vessels are needed for tumors to grow. It doesn't mean they all grow in the same way or require the same pathways, but anti-angiogenics do seem to slow down the growth of many different uh, oncogene addicted cancers. Um, I don't know if you're actually going to get formal shrinkage, but you may extend out progression-free survival when you add these things in. Uh, this question is definitely for you, Ross. Mm -hmm. Could you please talk about MET alteration? Uh, so MET is definitely coming up as, you know, best supporting actor in a number of different things, uh, both in the ALK world, the ROS1 world, and, and then most famously in the EGFR. It can be a primary driver of lung cancer, but it can also come in as a secondary driver of resistance. One of those second pathways that talks about where ALK might still be being suppressed. The issue is it can be turned on in a number of different ways. So MET amplification, that's multiple copies of the MET gene, is that best recognized, but with all of the challenge that, well, is it two copies, five copies, 10 copies? So it's a continuous variable. Where do you put the cut point to say this level matters and this level doesn't? We also know that other means of turning on MET, so MET mutations, MET fusions, have been described rarely. And we know that sometimes MET can be turned on without a signal by any of our current means of looking for mutations or gene rearrangements. So it can come on when you grow the cell lines. And that opens up a whole new area where we don't have to find new pathways. We have to find ways that new ways of finding if the pathways are turned on. And that may fill in in the future some of that unknown slice of the pie where there's an unknown second driver. Um, and you know we have, at least in our practice, at least two cases now where we've proven that in cell lines added in a MET inhibitor and the patient has responded. So can I, we have, we're getting a bunch of messages. You have two minutes left, one minute left. I think um, <laughs> I'd like to end with the, with the message, with one, one of the messages I want to end with is, you know, no one investigator or center can study these questions alone because um, there's just not, no one of us has enough, you know, enough um, tumor samples from patients with out positive lung cancer to really answer some of these questions about resistance in a, in a very robust way. And so we really need to think about ways to partner together to you know, get make a collection of samples. I think it would be amazing if we had um, you know, some sort of a tumor banking under the ALK positive group um, that would actually you know, be a resource for the community because and Ross, myself, everybody at MGH, everybody, name your big centers, like even we can't systematically answer these questions alone because it's just not 
enough um, material to, to be able to do this. And so this, I think, is, a, is really a way that we can partner together to ask questions about what's driving resistance in, in a more systematic way, because we, we don't. It's still, you know, small case series, like 10 to 20 patients, not 100 patients even. Um, but I think that's a very, very important direction for us to all go in in the future. Terrific. I think that's where hopefully the Enigma Plus study will be very helpful with that in a way, with at least, I guess that's for liquid. No, is that for, is that for that's tissue? Or? For tissue. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that, does, what, does that sound kind of like what you're looking for, Dr. Lovely? Um, yes and no. I think, you know, that the, they're really going to focus on the immune composition of the tumor. Um, but I think, you know, in the ideal case scenario, we would um, have tumors with, you know, annotated clinical information, any, you know, tumor molecular studies that were done clinically, and then actually have some additional tumor as a, as a uh, mechanism to do even broader stroke studies. So this is a huge, huge gap in our study of alpha positive lung cancer that I think needs to be much broader than any one institution and much broader than any one researcher. It has to be a community that comes behind this to, to really get the number of samples and analyze the data in the most rigorous way so that we can collectively um, move the field of alpha TKI resistance forward. I guess on that note, we'll call it stronger, to, stronger together. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. It's been a very illuminating conversation and uh, there is definitely lots of exciting new uh, things happening on the horizon. And I think we have to wrap it up. So we'll talk soon. Everyone Thanks, enjoy everyone. the rest of the weekend. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye.